Testing. All right, let's get started here. I think a few more people are coming in. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about intrusion detection in OpenStack. Um, I work at Red Hat in storage, actually. But I also teach as an adjunct professor at, at uh, the University of Massachusetts at Lowell, where I teach uh, some courses in security and intrusion detection. And at Red Hat, I work with uh, a bunch of OpenStack people and Swift and other areas. So that was the impetus for me getting interested in intrusion detection through my, through my uh, uh, job external to, uh, to Red Hat. Um, so in this talk, um, for, first of all, I hope to meet people who are also interested in this subject. Um, I'm going to show you what I've come up with to get intrusion detection working uh, in OpenStack, sort of where I see it going. Um, I'd like to hear feedback from people, if this is the right direction or not. Um, and I hope to do a lot of that this week. Um, so what I'll first talk about are network intrusion detection systems. Um, I'll look at the design, some different use cases, uh, the network plumbing, the you know, changes to neutron that are, I see needed in order to make it work. And we'll look a little bit on the, at the performance, which is a kind of a, a slippery area in uh, OpenStack, but I'll highlight some of the key uh, considerations that you run into when you set up uh, an IDS. Um, I'll spend a, a bit of time on host intrusion detection systems. I think host intrusion detection systems are, are quite interesting and probably have a, uh, a great role to play in, uh, in OpenStack. Um, actually devote half my course to uh, HIDSs and in particular we're trying to put um, an HIDS and a network IDS together, so they work together. Uh, this is the way commercial vendors uh, uh, sell their products. They don't, they don't have a network IDS or a host IDS necessarily. They, they give a combination package, and I think we can do that too. Um, and I'll talk about that. Uh, right, and then some uh, next steps is where I, you know, how we can, how we can make this easier, because a lot of this is uh, I've found to be uh, do-it-yourself, which is and sometimes quite difficult. Okay, so first, uh, network intrusion detection systems. Um, a recap of what these are for. Um, so a network intrusion detection system, what it basically does is it analyzes packets when they enter into the system. They, they look at them, they inspect them, and uh, uh, if they detect something that's malicious, that's suspicious, an alert will be uh, created. The, the operator will somehow be contacted or a log generated. Um, and potentially, uh, there's also something in the lingo called an active response. An active response is some action to take to stop whatever the bad behavior is from uh, happening. Um, network intrusion detection systems come in, in uh, uh, two flavors broadly. One of them is uh, signature-based, and what that is is basically you have uh, rules which spell out in fine-grained detail exactly what the suspicious activity is. I'll have an example on the next slide. Um, spell out the patterns, that's bad. Um, these rules are sometimes called core rule sets and uh, can be maintained by the community, by, by us. So if there's a, a new attack that comes out, say, you know, zero day attack comes out or whatever, uh, someone will make a brand new rule and upload it and it will get into the uh, configuration, you know, very soon. Uh, Snort is really the best uh, well-known um, IDS of, of this sort. Another one is uh, called Bro, um, and this one is anomaly based, and basically what it does is it learns what it is capable of doing, is learning uh, the, uh, the, the normal traffic and uh, sending an alert when there's a deviation from that norm. This is um, also uh, script-based. Uh, it's almost like a programming language. So you can, it's possible to do some extremely complex 
analysis. Um, I'm not talking, uh, going to talk about Bro. I actually have found it a little complicated to use, but I think a lot of the, um, the techniques that I'll be talking about will be applicable to Bro. So here's a, just a quick example of um, uh, some rules that you might find in Snort. Uh, these are reconnaissance rules, so we're you know, port scanning. Um, there, um, the rule here is alerting if a TCP packet comes in from any IP address or any port, that's the first four columns there, that arrives at the home net, that's our, my IP address to any port. If the flags uh, sin or fin, that's the top line, are uh, set, this is a, a fin, sin fin scan, so-called, and uh, uh, that rule will uh, trigger that has a unique identifier and a message is displayed. Uh, here's another example of the shell-shocked uh, rule. Um, there's a simplified one, which uh, we did in our class. You see the content is just looking for a four-character uh, string, uh, open parentheses, close parentheses, space, open bracket. Um, that was acceptable for demonstrating uh, how to find uh, shell-shocked. The actual rule used by Snort, as you can see below, is way more complex, and it's very, very fine-grained detail. Okay, so those are some example rules, give you a flavor. All right, why would you want to use, or how could you, what are the ways that you could use a network IDS uh, in OpenStack? Um, I use the word tenant throughout these slides, but project interchangeably. Uh, well, if you're a, a tenant project administrator, you probably want to guard your instances. Uh, so a, uh, a likely scenario that you could see uh, would be to uh, download and run a network IDS inside of an instance and uh, use it to guard the other instances. And that instance that you have would be charged just like any other instance. And then another use case that is plausible is of the administrator of the cloud itself. In this case, you could have a network IDS guard all the tenants and all the instances across all the, in, all the tenants. And here you have a, a very practical problem. Uh, you could have IP addresses that are the same across two tenants. Not a big deal, though. Snort can recognize uh, VLAN tags. Each tenant has its own tag. And you can even have, in Snort, different configuration files or different rule sets for each uh, tenant. So those are the two use cases. The first one, I think, is a bit more interesting, and that's what I'm sort of focusing on. Uh, and we could call that IDS as a service. So um, IDS as a service, where would we want to place a network IDS? Well, this is, I think, probably a graph that everyone should be uh, familiar with. I assume most of you are. The key, the key points are um, that I'm using RDO uh, that's the Red Hat uh, OpenStack distro. Um, so I'm using Open V switch. So I'll be talking about Open V switch. Um, the major piece here that matters is the integration bridge. All the instances go through there. And uh, right above that, the one that, with the three word letters QBR, that's a Linux firewall bridge. Linux firewall because it has to use IP tables. And those connect to the green circles, which are the uh, instances. OK, so one way you could put a network IDS into OpenStack would be to just have a gateway. You hit a new instance, and you feed all traffic through this gateway, maybe perhaps after the firewall. And um, it could be a sort of a store and forward model. So packets come into this gateway, and then they go out to the instance. Um, it would be slow, because it's store and forward. Now, I know some, some, actual, some people are actually trying to implement this. Uh, I, I ran into some students in Australia. Who are, who are doing some work on this. And I think it's very interesting. Um, it's, it's not my approach. So I'm just going to cross that out, because I, I, I have a goal, an interest in uh, unobtrusiveness. So what I'm trying to do is create a, what's called a mirror, or, or use port mirroring. And what this would do is it would take a tap, basically, on the wire somewhere in that software-defined network and make a mirror copy of all the traffic and feed that to the network IDS, which can then do what it needs to do. The downside with this approach would be that some of your um, vir uh, virtual cores are still have to be allocated to run that network uh, IDS. 
Um, so it's, but at least you're taking the traffic out of band. So if you're going to add this tap to um, the uh, OpenStack, where would be a good place to put it? Well, I believe uh, the integration bridge is a, an appropriate place because all the, all the instances go through there. That's the main uh, intersection of them all. And you could choose all the instances uh, in your tenant or some subset. So how is this done exactly? <laughs> this is the fun part and where I think uh, OpenStack is explosively complex if you don't come from a network background. Um, so let's say you, you want to you wanna do this um, and you have uh, uh, created an instance and you've loaded it with uh, uh, IDS. Maybe there's a, there's a bunch of nice distros out there which you can, you can, uh, that, that have preloaded with uh, security uh, IDSs. So you have this basic uh, setup. This is out of the box. Create the instance, and it creates a, what's called a tap interface, which is connected to that instance. And that, in turn, connects to the lower box, which is the Linux bridge, the AKA firewall. All right, how are we going to do this tap? Well, I want, my goal is I want to move traffic from other instances to this NIDS so it can read it and react. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new port and attach that port to this instance. So there, so far I've not really done anything uh, that interesting. I've created a brand new firewall, as you can see, and I've created a, a new tap interface. Well, that firewall is just going to block all my uh, traffic, which is going to come from the instances that this NIDS is guarding. So I've got to somehow get rid of that firewall. No problem. There, I just got rid of it. I, now, I understand a lot of flashing the word hack in your face. Well, that's part of the reason I'm here. And also, another point is that there's something called tap as a service, which is being talked about this week, and I really am looking forward. This is how I got as far as I did as of now. So we got rid of that, um, and now we can add that directly to the integration bridge. Okay, so I still need to move traffic into the network IDS. How am I going to do that? Well, here's a cool command for uh, open vSwitch. And it's a long one, but basically what it does is it selects um, uh, input ports and creates a mirror to out the output port. I have a single instance which I've directed to mirror, but I could have selected more than that. I could have selected or I could have selected all of the instances belonging to a particular tag, i.e. tenant. So this, this is the low-level, nitty-gritty way of accomplishing this. And of course, you want to make this easier. You don't want to have to go through this yourself. But this is what's going on under the hood, I think. All right, so I've just talked about a way to accomplish this on the same node. And as I mentioned, we're consuming virtual cores by doing this. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to consume virtual cores on that uh, compute node? Well, uh, a way uh, to uh, avoid that would be to create another machine, a monitoring node, I call it, which would be responsible for monitoring only. And perhaps it has a different set of hardware to do that, maybe better set of hardware, maybe tuned. So you can create a tunnel to talk to that. And here is, in a bit ugly uh, graphics, but you'll get the idea. I create a patch cable and attach it to the uh, integration bridge. And I mirror traffic to that patch cable. Then I attach that patch cable to another bridge called the tunnel bridge, which I'm calling a tunnel bridge. And then you can use the same kind of command, the same uh, where you create a mirror mirroring from the patch cable to something else. And what this something else is a generic routing encapsulation uh, interface, which will be connected to another node. Again, this is low level stuff. And the, one of the nice things I hope to get out of this week is to make this easier and simpler. But this is how you make it work. OK, so here, um, if you do play with this stuff, I just uh, have a few. Um, 
tips uh, to uh, make your life easier. Basically, whenever you create a new component in your uh, network, ping it. <laughs> or ping the element right before it. And you'll, there are counters at each step of the way, and you'll know if the packet reached that new point by looking at the counters. Um, it can be uh, dreadfully difficult. All right, so let's, now that we've got this down, we've got a way to do it, uh, let's analyze it at a little bit of a higher level. So um, what happens when, uh, why do we care about performance? Well, one, one reason is that if, uh, the, if the limits of the network IDS uh, CPU power is reached, if the number of virtual cores power is, is, is exceeded, packets will be dropped. And when packets are dropped, you can get false negatives. You may think nothing's wrong when something really is wrong. And keep in mind, we're doing fan in here. We're taking multiple instances within your tenant, potentially, and fanning all that traffic into the uh, one network IDS. So if we're going to be, we want to avoid that. Um, what, uh, how do we analyze this? So there's two, two areas to look at. One is the open vSwitch component and the other is uh, the CPU overhead of the, of the network uh, IDS. Um, there are some upper bounds uh, which, which are right here. I haven't gotten anywhere near to uh, getting to that level, but that's, that's the ultimate uh, upper edge of the envelope. All right, so open vSwitch performance. Um, I'm sure many people here are familiar with it. For those who aren't, I'll just recap that uh, it has a, a large cache of uh, flows that it keeps, maintains in the kernel. So when a MAC address comes in and it has to determine the, the destination port, it can consult this table in the kernel. Some, I guess you could call it a CAM table. And um, uh, not have to get exit the, to uh, user space. And that's, that's really fast. Also, this table is very large. So um, normally, happy path is that you're in the kernel and it's quick. Um, if there's a MAC address that shows up uh, and it doesn't exist in that table, you jump to user space, but that should only happen for that first time. So, um, and then another point is that we're not copying packets as they traverse the, the network from hop to hop. Very good, but, <laughs> Here's the problem. Uh, there's a 30% reduction when you do the port mirroring in Open vSwitch. Um, I, uh, w I, I measured this, I ran into it myself, uh, I did a double take, and then I found a uh, paper written last year which uh, had this great table, and I, and I put the citation below it. Um, the, the numbers on the bottom are the number of uh, times that you, the packet has been uh, mirrored. Um, so th there's no mirror in the first uh, bar, one. The second time, there's a 30% reduction because we're mirroring it once. Three, we're mirroring it twice. Four, on and on and on. You can see each time you mirror it, packet, uh, your total packets per second, megabits per second uh, drops. So this is a, a serious overhead and something to talk about this week. Um, snort performance, the other, other component to study. Well, uh, snort is uh, single-threaded uh, at the moment. It's going to become multi-threaded in 3.0, so I've read. Um, so at the moment, it won't necessarily, and I'll put necessarily in quotes, scale with additional cores. Um, it is possible to run multiple snort instances and give each its own configuration file. Um, something you might want to tune is uh, string searching, uh, how packets are searched for when you're looking for, say, that shell-shocked string. There's, there's faster algorithms to do that, and there's recommendations to uh, do that tuning. Um, a alternative to snort is something called shurikata. This is multi-threaded from day one. Uh, and is also compatible with the snort rules. Um, and I cite uh, one paper, there's a few out there, which have done head-to-head -head bake-offs between Shurikata and snort and shown that Shurikata is faster. Okay, 
So that's network IDS, how it can be made to work in OpenStack. Let's talk about host intrusion detection systems. Um, I'll have a few slides where I motivate its usefulness. Um, basically, it uh, does virus scanning and then some other things, policy checking and file integrity checking. Um, in the open source world, uh, a popular one is called OSEC, and it does a few other nice things, which I think could be useful in the cloud space, such as log aggregation. So I'm an administrator. I do not want to look at 10 different logs, one snort logs, one var log messages. Maybe I have a web application firewall or a WAF from running mod security. Um, all these logs are driving me nuts. What OSEC can do is consolidate them all. It can, it can parse each one of those, and, and, and so you have only one single set of logs to uh, deal with. Um, that's useful. The second thing that's uh, nice about OSEC is that it is centrally controlled. So I don't have to look at the logs on each of my instances. I can go to one instance, the, which is called the OSEC server, and it will read from the different um, um, uh, instances which are running what are called OSEC agents and monitor via the OSEC agents uh, uh, for bad behavior. Okay, so here's a, a kind of a icky picture, but uh, basically you can see that, that there's an OSEC server on the right and logs are being sent from the six uh, servers on the left uh, where they're, so they're being parsed on the OSEC server and being read from uh, uh, the six uh, uh, systems on the left. Now, those six systems, you can just imagine those to be uh, OpenStack instances. So here's a few things that uh, OSEC can do. One of his is file integrity checking. A, um, a bad guy might come in and uh, say, modify the ls command or modify some other command. How would you know that they modified that command and perhaps put in some sort of Trojan horse? Well, if you take a hash of that slash bin slash ls and you store that somewhere and then periodically check to see and to take another hash of bin ls and see if it matches the one that you, the known one, well then that's how you'll know if it changed or not. So that's one thing that OSEC can do and you can configure what uh, directories to check. Um, another thing that OSEC can do that's very nice um, is it's some, what's called policy checking. This is con checking configuration files to make sure they haven't been tampered with. So for example, let's say you have a rule in your uh, space that says you must run SE Linux and say you're a bad guy and you you want people to be miserable. So what what uh, this does is it checks that uh, it is in enforcing mode and it will send an alert if it's not. This is one thing to note. OSEC doesn't necessarily check for these in real time. Uh, it's a very slow process to compute the hashes of all the files. So this is done perhaps on an hourly or greater basis. Uh, unlike the network IDS case. So let's say somebody tried to log in as root with the wrong password and an alert, an OSEC alert is generated. What happens then? Well, you get an active response. Now an active response in OSEC is actually very nice because it's a script. It can do anything. A shell script can in turn invoke Python or uh, evoke uh, OpenStack API, and this, I think, is another very useful property. Here are some things uh, that are typically done. Blocking the user, maybe uh, turning off the user, um, destroying the user, turning off uh, the tenant somehow, maybe adding a firewall rule. Um, these are all possible. They're all within the range of possibility. Now. Uh, Snort can also do active responses, but my understanding is that it uh, doesn't let you run an arbitrary script. It's a little more limited in the sorts of uh, active responses that it allows. Namely, it can reset the TCP connection or send uh, INC, ICMP host unknown, if I, if I remember right. So um, it's, it's not as uh, powerful in that respect. Uh, and here's just an example of uh, on the top I've created a, a script called wall.shell, and on the bottom I say run that if rule 
5503 triggers. Okay, so back to use cases. Well, it goes back to um, if you're uh, uh, an administrator and your role uh, of, is to administrate a tenant, uh, then you would like to um, perhaps run OSEC on all the instances which are uh, under your uh, control. Um, now, the only downside here is that you need to run that OSEC agent on each of those uh, ins on each of those instances. The agent is the one that feeds information back to the OSEC server. And so you have to, those are the glance images that you would have to provide to people. Uh, as for the other use case, the hypervisor administrator, I see uh, 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 configuration files um, uh, of OpenStack uh, you, being uh, uh, looked uh, for and uh, some rules created to um, check their validity. Okay, so let's put it all together. Here we go. So, if you have um, perhaps uh, two instances here, which may or may not be on separate machines, and uh, you have a monitored instance, which also happens to be an OSEC agent, traffic will come in, say malicious traffic, and uh, you, that traffic gets mirrored, uh, to the other instance, which is your monitoring instance, that's uh, Snort, uh, and uh, it generates a log file. The log file is read by OSEC, which in turn runs a uh, active response, which is a shell script, which will ultimately block the traffic. <laughs> this, is, this is the goal. Um, and uh, you don't need to run OSEC because, as I mentioned, Snort runs some uh, limited but useful and important set of uh, active responses. So the same uh, workflow can, can basically work. All right, given this whole background, architecture of how uh, IDSs could work in uh, Snort, and we have a way to do it in Neutron, boy, how can we make this easier? Because it's, it's, it's so, too many moving parts. Well, first of all, um, I'm, I believe there's going to be a talk later uh, this week called Tap as a Service. That is exactly what this uh, an IDS needs, so I think that's something to, to look forward to. Um, we need a way to create a tunnel that's, uh, that's easy. Um, and uh, probably it'd be nice to have some pre-built images which run the network IDS and the uh, HIDS. Um, we need some workflows. Uh, one workflow would be setting this all up in the very beginning. Um, we want to monitor the IDS. Now, monitoring the IDS, uh, um, both uh, Snort and OSEC, most of them all have nice uh, GUIs uh, so the, uh, over HTML, and so that can be uh, something that you could probably access via the monitoring uh, instance. Um, and you want to be able to make sure that when you add and remove instances, they're included in the port mirroring uh, infrastructure, however that ultimately pans out. So, in conclusion, uh, IDS on OpenStack is uh, very much a do-it-yourself thing, in my experience. Um, I have not found too many people who are uh, working on this actively, and I'd like to meet some people who are. Uh, I think the orchestration is uh, quite complex, what can we do to make this easier? Um, performance. Um, having an additional monitor node is ideal. It may not be necessary for everybody if you don't have a high amount of traffic, and it's also an uh, extra expense because it's extra hardware. Um, you uh, would want to look at uh, Syracuse Kata if you're very interested in high performance. Um, or, or at least work with multiple Snort instances. And in the short term, a lot of people who are interested in IDSs are looking forward to the new Snort 3.0, which is gonna be uh, faster, presumably. And lastly, and this is another thing I hope to get into this week, uh, is um, why are we seeing the support mirroring uh, drop in performance? Is it because we're actually copying the packet under the hood? and this is resulting in a 30% drop. Um, what can we do to uh, 
and make that faster? Could we use reference counters or something and not delete the packet until they all go to zero? Who knows? Um, that's another area to talk about. And uh, that's my talk. So I'll bring it up to questions now. And uh, thank you very much. So we. So we are doing, playing around with some of the same things. Um, Who's in, we? Uh, AT and T. Okay. And in uh, in your example that you showed, the OVS control examples, they tended to be static, like you'd do in a lab. Um, in a production cloud environment where tenants are spinning up, uh, networks are spinning up, you have to spin your snorts up at the same time. Um, that's been a little harder for us, and, and we're playing around with doing that. Um, have you thought about how you'd want to make that work with your examples? So that would be the workflow of adding new instances to existing tenants? And, and new networks, all, all the dynamic things that happen in OpenStack clouds. Okay. Well, first, when you add new instances to the existing tenant, I think the probably that would be adding, changing the port mirroring so that you're, you're, you're uh, I suppose you'd have to tear down the old one and create a new one. So yeah, that would cause an interruption. Huh. And something could sneak in the middle there. Um, I haven't thought about brand new tenants. Um, and that would, of course, be a whole new port uh, mirroring construct. Um, I mean, in general, uh, this is sort of the next step for me. And I'd like to talk to you more about this after the after, uh, afterwards. Uh, okay, I'm a bit too tall again there. Uh, another question about where you monitor the traffic. Now you do it on the bridges on the compute host themselves with that solution. It seems like this is really hard to scale when you run 100 or 200 compute nodes where you ha would have to do it per tenant, per node, and monitor, like, mirror all the traffic from there, from each node for each tenant. Could you? Wouldn't it be better to do it if you run uh, Neutron L3 routers to actually mirror it from the L3 routers themselves? Because I guess the incoming traffic from the internet is what you're mostly concerned about. And there you will get all of that traffic from one place. So you're saying as the traffic enters the cloud, yeah. you, you intercept it at that time yeah. rather than at the integration bridge? Pretty much, yeah. I, I kind of, depending where you do it, either for the whole cloud or per tenant. So sort of like on the public network. Yeah. Right before the public network, you could have a tap. Or in the, in the L3 router itself, if that would have the... Oh, in the L3 router. That's an interesting uh, idea. I, do, I, I guess I don't have a good feeling for the scalability problem. My understanding is Open vSwitch is uh, so-called screamingly fast, and I haven't encountered myself, I, to be quite honest, I haven't done big scalability tests, but I, I haven't encountered a problem with scalability. Yeah. Did you mean in terms uh, of the I think number of IDS instances? I'm thinking more of the complexity when you scale, not the actual performance. Oh, the complexity. I see. So in other words, I have many IDS instances, one for each tenant, and there's a lot going on there. And maybe one for each tenant per host, even, depending on how you set it up, because you might have 100 compute hosts. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I guess I leave that kind of, I punt <laughs> that to the administrator of the, um, of the uh, tenant, aka project. I basically say, you know, this is, you can do it easy or you can do it hard, and it's sort of on your, what you're saying, I wonder, is if that's more of the hypervisor level uh, intrusion detection rather than tenant level. I, I, I think you could do both. Mm. Okay. Well, I, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't occur to me how that's simpler, but we could, I'd like to talk to you We more. can discuss it after sure. this. Again, too, too tall. Uh, hi, so uh, Mauricio from HP, and so networking team uh, working in collaboration with the Tipping Point security team. So we're working on facets of this. Uh, so would love to, to um, follow up with you. But my question uh, to you is that uh, it seems that you discounted the uh, middle box use case entirely. And by middle box, I mean the intrusion prevention use case where you're not just reporting. So I see IDS is still being useful in the tool set to be able to report when there's a security violation. 
Right. However, in many instances, people want to take the next step and actually do active uh, filtering. And so in the use case, it seems that, or in the discussion today, it seems like you completely discounted oh. the, 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 the I possibility. I had some stuff on it. I didn't discount it at all. I, 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 uh, let me go back and go back to here. So you're talking about active responses? Yes, but, but uh, real time, I guess, like in the case of an IPS, it may do a uh, There would a be a delay, yeah, in that yeah. case, yeah. So do you see that uh, as a next step beyond addressing the, the, the basic IDS use case? Okay, well, in the, the, the vision that I outline here, uh, there is a delay, admittedly. I don't know how big the delay is. It might not be a big delay. It, it can't be a big delay, because if it, if it was a big delay, then we'd be falling behind and we'd be eventually dropping packets. And I say a priori, we cannot drop packets. So I don't know if the delay would be that big. Um, but if you want exact real time, then really you do need some sort of gateway model where you inspect the packet first, store and forward, and you do not forward that packet to its destination until you've inspected it and, and some, somehow vetted it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you mean. Exactly. So we'll follow up because we've got some uh, ongoing yeah. work, like I said. I see some big performance issues with that, but uh, technically, uh, with enough hardware, you could, you could do it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. Hi, Rob Clark from HP. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting is to extend perhaps a little bit on the, uh, the L3 router concept. So when you were talking about how to apply IDS, I'm really interested in how I can see a tenant-wide view. I want to understand when a tenant or a project that's spread across multiple compute nodes and potentially across multiple different sites is either doing really bad things or having really bad things done to them. Um, and that becomes more difficult if you're operating at a compute node level because then you need to introduce some aggregation point elsewhere where you try and correlate different attacks that are going on against different parts or against different compute nodes. So I'm just wondering if you've had any thoughts in that space and um, if a few of us are getting together later to go over some of the IDS stuff, I think that would be an interesting topic. Uh, myself personally, no, because uh, I've struggled enough to get it working on a single compute node. However, there are lots of people at Red Hat who are working on uh, uh, it's more along the lines of what you're talking about, where you have different regions and clouds separated geographically and so on. Um, uh, I think also that, um, you know, what I want to try and do, what I want to try and, what I'm urging and pushing is, is that we somehow uh, uh, sort of agree on a way forward, right, and somehow make this easier so it's not so much of a do-it-yourself project. And perhaps uh, as part of the agenda for getting there, we should include um, uh, geogra regions, geographically dispersed uh, clouds and so forth and so on, tenants, which are maybe other, other two sides of the world, you know, on the other side of the world from each other and so on. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, amongst other things, I'm also the PTL for the security project in OpenStack. Um, we do a number of things, including the security guide, which is there to provide deployers with exactly this sort of guidance. Um, and I think it would be an interesting thing to include in that. So um, I'll follow up. Sounds good. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chandra from Cisco. Uh, have you considered uh, what's the implication of uh, this kind of uh, solution in a Linux bridge environment? Um, mainly looking at it because I see a lot of NFVs interested in that because of the VLAN, uh, because they do need the actual packet as is, and that's why Linux bridge is becoming more common in that case. Uh, let me, let me Instead of OVS, um, Instead of Open vSwitch. So you're saying, have I looked at Linux bridges as opposed to Open OVS. Virtual Switch? Yeah. Um, no, actually, because I, I'm using the Red Hat RDO distro, which has Open Virtual Switch built into it. And um, okay, so my understanding, my understanding is a Linux bridge has the same functionality of, of to do port mirroring. It does. However, I'm not sure it's got the same performance. And I and know about that. Well, the performance will be okay as long as you stay with VLAN, not VXLAN. Okay. But, but the command that you, s you put out there to do the port mirroring, is that supported? That's my... On the Linux bridge. On a Linux bridge. No, no, no. The syntax is completely different. And that... You would have to start... Uh, but, the, but the functionality yeah. would be the same, I believe. Right. And, and uh, um, again, I don't, I don't know that for sure because I haven't monkeyed with the Linux bridge. I've, I've 
quite happy with the open virtual switch, actually. It does, does a good job. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.